All right, all right. Enough of that already. <sighs> Dapper. Oh, see, okay, I was wrong about Dapper. Okay, see, I haven't even used it yet. It's, I got the wrong thing there. How's it going there, chat room? How we doing? Did you get something to drink? You get a little refreshment? You grab a, a nibble to, to eat? Um, aim to please. Thank you for, for paying for the gift sub to .NET Dev. That is very kind of you. Thanks so much. Um, hey, Veronica. Good. To look, here's the folks that are here in the chat room. Welcome back. Do I do I need do I need to change hats? I'm gonna change hats. We've been Twitch focused. I think we need to change hats. There we go. You tried .NET tie. .NET tie is an experimental new framework that the team is working on. Interesting stuff that could be done. W was I in the army? I just had a little nibble. I, I, if I eat like a full sandwich or, or a full bowl of soup or something, um, I, I end up losing energy quickly here. I want to keep energy high um, and and not right burn burn through too much here we're we're gonna be in great shape um all right let's get into our next module here let's get some more music to code by playing here in the background um and i'm gonna move on and choose well this is another one of our our favorites that we like here on the channel this is called cyan there you go once again, this is music scientifically designed. It's engineered to get you in the flow, get you in the groove, so you can focus on whatever task it is you might have. Check it out at mtcb.poop.com, or you can execute the music command in the chat room over there and get your copy today. Thank you so much, Mr. Carl Franklin, for letting us listen in to your music while we uh, work together here on stream. Get your coffee, Madrina's coffee. There's a logo in the corner, and Janescu with the coffee command. Thank you. That's right. I've got a little uh, a little water here to get me back into things here. So let's head back over. We're going to go into... This is module two now of the workshop. And we're going to talk about now building out a little bit more of an object graph. We learned how to build a simple API endpoint. How you can query, push data into, and interact with a microservice... Uh, with some code that was mostly generated for us after we defined what a speaker was. Well, now now we're going to take those steps to add some more objects and start reusing a little bit more code. Thank you, Jean Valjean, for sharing that. So, um, let's talk about the next piece. And the next piece kind of... Uh, I, we're going to circle back to that question we got earlier about... Hey, what's .NET standard? How does .NET standard play into this? I've heard I've heard about this standard thing. What is it? Well, we're going to create this project. This project of what's called DTOs, a data transfer object. And and a, a DTO in in application architecture is a a simple class that's just properties that we're going to pass around between the various layers of our application. It's just for transferring data, right? It doesn't have any logic in it. It doesn't make any decisions. It's literally a, a carrier. It's, it's the transit. Um, it's the train car for your data. <laughs> Look at that. That's a pretty good way to describe that. Yeah. All right. wait, wait, let me let me explain something to you. Um... It, it can be a little bit more complicated than that. But for what we're trying to do here, we're going to create these classes that we can share between both our back-end microservice and our front-end website. So let's create this DTO project. So I'm going to right-click, add new project. And I'm gonna specifically look for a class library. And you see I have class library.net standard with C sharp. Give me one of those. And we're gonna create this and call it conference DTO. All right, conference DTO. And it creates a .NET standard project. All right, so Jeff, what's a what's a .NET standard project? What's that mean? And it says .NET standard there, but uh, 
I, I don't get it. .NET's got a long history. A lot of folks have been writing a lot of .NET code for a very long time, 20 plus years. How do we ensure that code that was written a long time ago, um, that's written on .NET Framework maybe, works with .NET Core? Or maybe code that works on .NET Core and .NET Framework, how does that work with Xamarin if I want to make mobile applications? So what .NET Standard does is it defines an API level, right? You see API levels in, in Java and other languages. But it defines a level of compatibility that different .NET frameworks, must, and I say not because not .NET framework, but other .NET frameworks must adhere to, must abide by, in order to be considered standard. So you can go out there on the documentation for .NET Standard. It'll show you the various APIs for the various, various, oh no, for the various .NET version levels, .NET Standard version levels, and what compatibility they have. And in particular, we recommend folks right now use .NET Standard 2.0 or 2.1. You'll see most, most folks use .NET Standard 2.0. Ah, I turned off the, the words um, bit there. I've got a, anyways. Um, so, .NET Standard 2.0 has the highest level of compatibility between .NET Framework and .NET Core and Xamarin. So, by creating a class library here that has these objects in it that we're going to use between a couple of .NET Core framework .NET Core projects, we can reference this and it will appropriately be it'll behave appropriately when it's consumed by that dotnet core application further in the future and we're not going to do it as part of this project but in the future i could reference this library and use it in a xamarin application and have the same ability to trans transfer data back and forth between my microservice and my mobile application so that's what .NET Standard is. It's a, it's a way for us to, to gain portability of our business logic across .NET framework runtime versions. Words are the enemy. Yes. Yes, they are. And I'm going to hit that because we need to get the um, Joshua, that a, makes a, a pretty good point here. Let me bring this up because it's a good discussion point. Um, Josh knows of .NET Standard because of Unity where it's the standard .NET API when you create a new project. Um, under the impression this might be the bridge to .NET Core and 5, since the other option is .NET Framework 4. Yes. Yes. So, when you see other folks here on Twitch using Unity and they're building games, or maybe you're building games with Unity, you're actually using the Mono version of the .NET Framework. And Mono was originally written, I want to say, back in 2004. 2008 time frame by our friend Miguel Diacaza and the folks at it was, the name of the company was Zimian at the time and it was intended to give that open source friendly version of .NET that you could use in places that weren't Windows well Unity the Unity team took Mono and used it as the framework to build their game engine on top of well, Mono has been updated and has kept track, but a little bit distant track from .NET Framework and now .NET Core. And since .NET Core is completely open source, there's a lot of cross-pollination actually between Mono and .NET Core. So much so that if you go to the .NET Core source code on GitHub, that it, they merged Mono and .NET Core, and that's what .NET 5 is. It's not going to get rid of .NET Standard because we still need to have compatibility back to .NET Framework. Like I said earlier, .NET Framework is, is a component of Windows, so it's always going to be shipped. When there's a new version of Windows, .NET Framework ships, and it resets the support cycle for .NET Framework. But for .NET Core and Mono and Xamarin, right, because Xamarin's built on top of Mono, um... This means that you have compatibility across them. .NET Standard helps to ensure that you have good access across all of those things. And I was saying about if you look at the source code, now for .NET Core, because they merged the mono source code, open source source code, and the .NET Core source code, 
the first commit for .NET is by Miguel Diacas. How fitting that Miguel is now an employee and he is the first committer of .NET source code. Great stuff. Um, .NET standard, you're right, Death Knight. And <clears throat> to continue the discussion, um, it's just the APIs and not the implementations. This is a very good point. <clears throat> when we build this class library, it doesn't actually build it, it doesn't actually build runnable code. It builds code that is referenced by another project. This builds a DLL, but that DLL, when it's referenced by another project, will then have the appropriate implementations. This is a little bit further down the stack, but it's it's just pointing to those contracts for for .NET, for those .NET APIs. And when you reference .NET Core or .NET Framework or Xamarin or Mono for, for Unity, it then slides in at build time the appropriate real implementations of those contracts. So you'll see here, we're gonna create things that are strings and ints and, and right, different complex types. It doesn't actually reference, right? Not just those value types, but other complex types they'll get swapped in with their proper implementations at compile time when referenced by a .NET Core application, maybe a Xamarin mobile application, or a mono game, right? I mean, that's tremendous to think that, right, the things that we're building for uh, for a game for with mono, I can take some of that logic out of there, some of the stuff around my character there, some of the stuff around my character or maybe my high score, uh, scoreboard that I'm building inside my game and I can pull that out into a .NET standard project like this one we're about to build and reuse it in your .NET Core website that will allow people to see you know across the entire community here's the high scores or here's you know whatever the logic for your game might be being able to reuse that now in a website and the game engine or publish it out to a web application really great story about how you can do that reuse across the various stuff. All right. Well, .NET is not an abstraction. Let me, well, let's, uh, .NET, uh, yes, yes. I'm sorry, I, I play poker badly. I, uh, every time I say that, I feel like you're tricking me. I play poker pretty okay, but I play poker badly. Says, so .NET standard is just an abstraction. Yes, it's just a series of contracts that when we build a project that targets .NET standard, we're, we're building on top of those contracts, that abstraction over those implementations. And when we actually build, it fulfills that contract, that abstraction with the appropriate implementation for Windows, for Linux, for your game engine, for iOS or Android at that time. It's really great stuff. Um, WQ Walter. <clears throat> asks there it is is there an expected update to dotnet core this spring will it require code changes like going from one to two to two to three no there is no minor update coming the next version coming is um is dotnet 5. there's there is a the, the release of blazer in a series of packages that are versioned 3.2 that's Blazor for WebAssembly is coming out this spring. The, the team is full steam ahead on .NET 5. There are some uh, security patches. There are some bug fixes that you're going to see in minor patch releases, but there is not a minor release. You will not see .NET Core 3.2, 3.3. The next version of .NET is .NET 5. And is the migration going to be easy to .NET 5? That's the goal. Um, so much so that, that I, I think I can share with you that the, the statement to the team is if the migration for .NET core developers to .NET 5 isn't really easy to do just by changing a version number and, and patching one or two things, if there's a significant rewrite involved, they failed. That's, th that's one of the entrance gates is it needs to maintain a good bit of compatibility in code back and forth between the versions. Thank you for the question, Walter. Uh, Marcus Voice Programmer, thank you so much for the cheer, those 200 bits, and we're gonna make a donation to support the World Health Organization 
and their fight against COVID-19. All the cheers, all the subs on this channel, all quarter long, we're going to support the World Health Organization and their fight against COVID-19. Death Knight asks, How do you magically pop that box up on the screen? Am I the Fonz? Yes, I am. Um, this is a service called Featured Chat. If you browse to featured.chat, um, you can sign up uh, with uh, your stream, your Twitch channel, and your Twitch chat will appear down the side, and you can choose messages to put up on screen when you embed the Featured Chat output in OBS. Our friend Lucky Number 7 from the Live Coders team wrote this, um, and it was debuted at TwitchCon North America in 2019. Really great stuff. Really happy with how this works. It's, and, it's, and it's great to be able to show and, and highlight what we're talking to. It is. It's a perfect extension for the channel. I completely agree there. Confuse Lele. I hope I, and I hope I pronounce it. Oh, for you, the feature chat is beneath the speech to text. Uh, right, if you have closed captioning turn. So here's the thing. Closed captioning here on Twitch, there's a button... It's usually somewhere right around here. It's a little CC button because I have closed captioning turned on. I'm broadcasting closed captions for this. It's being automatically generated and layered into the video that's being delivered. There are There's a gear, or it's either a gear or there's a button next to the closed captioning that you can click. And you can change the location of the closed captioning. You can change the font size, the color. You can customize how... Twitch presents the closed captioning for you on the channel if that's something that you want to see. If you're watching on YouTube, you're on YouTube. It's somewhere else here. You can turn it on and off. You can see it. So. Uh, do, 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 do. Confused Lele is confused about how to pronounce their name. Uh, yeah, we're all confused. It's good. <laughs> Thank you so much for hanging around. I appreciate you joining us today. Uh, you thought that was something I made gnarly? Yes, I will take full credit for it, and then my friend Lucky Number Seven will be upset at me. No, I I don't take. What? Wait. Who wrote that? Who did that? I didn't put that up. Somebody's messing with me here. It's all magic. I don't know. I don't know where it's coming from, but absolutely. Lucky number seven put that together. It's tremendous. There's different themes and things in there. And he's he's adding features all the time. It's really great stuff. And you're going to see us use it during the Live Coders Conf next week. Next Thursday, six days away from our big virtual conference with the entire Live Coders team. 14 team members, bunch of folks supporting and moderating. It's going to be a great day. I hope you check it out. Conf.livecoders.dev. You can see more about that. So let's start building. This is our .NET standard project, and we're going to put our objects in here that we're going to share coming out of our microservice so that our web front end can use it. So uh, you can also create it at the command line. You saw me go through how to do this at uh, in Visual Studio, and we're going to add a reference in the back end project. Well, that's not spelled right. And we're going to add a reference to our conference DTO. We do that with add... Where is it? Add assembly reference. Ah, I'm going to add a project reference. Yep, there it is. It's another project in the solution. So now it references it. You can also do it at the command line very easily with the .NET add reference command. Okay. Um, do do and add it to the solution. Well, I've already got it over here, but that's the command. Hey, go away. To add it to it. So let's make our speaker that we have sitting here in our in our models folder let's move it over into the conference DTO project so we can share that so we need that component model annotations package that defines um, exactly what where to go speaker exactly what these things are we need that in our um, in our dotnet standard project so I can right click on this. You saw me do the .NET add package. Let me show you how to do this in Visual Studio. I can say manage NuGet packages. Come over here to browse and I can actually copy in the name of this. 
it'll search for find that project that package and I can install it with a little download arrow button there and it's now in my project uh, yes save it so if I double click on this you will see there it is and you can always type that in if you feel like updating XML it's always there um, so now I have that available and we're gonna go into the backend application and we're gonna chunk this out so it's actually inheriting from the conference DTO speaker object well before I really do that let me I'm gonna copy this object paste it over here so I've got my speaker object and I'm gonna change my namespace because this is in the conference DTO project there's my speaker here I don't need class one go away class one we don't want class one we're not first class we're third class something like that so, and the original speaker that's over here I don't need all of these features and I'm going to inherit from conference DTO speaker remember I showed you this inheriting thing it says well this speaker is a more defined type of speaker so this contains the generic reference of well here's what it looks like but we can add other things into this file that are appropriate for the storage and retrieval of speakers so let me come back over here and it wants me to, to run this to show you that yes it does work and nothing has changed it now still brings up the speaker information still shows it looks great blah 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 right uh, that's a thing um let's see what do we get here um uh-oh what did you do i see a clip c sharp fritz was hacked <laughs> uh yes my my p.o box does accept accept parcels if so there if, if anybody you're always welcome to send me anything i have a p.o box listed there on the twitch channel just below the video in the about me section if, if you want to send me something, you want to send me uh, art or, or uh, something, a hat to wear, whatever, take a look. It's right over there. Everything continues to build, just like we said. And if I open up the speakers here, well, now it doesn't have that XML documentation being generated by this project. So I kind of lost it here. We can pivot and go find it and tell it where to load this data. But for the purposes of getting this to work, Right, if I tell it, uh, yeah, try it out, go get the speakers, and there it is. It still loads my data. So it still works. That's great. But we need to add more. We need more models and things in here. So we need information about attendees. So we're going to add an attendee class into the mix here. So these are just more model classes that are going to help to round out uh, over here that are going to help to round out our um, our project that, that we're building here so there isn't too much to really see with these they're very much doing the same thing that we did with our speaker object ID name username email address along with some constraints around those attendee properties that we're going to create and we have another one here for session so we can define the sessions that a speaker delivers so I'll create a session and it's funny it's a session class shouldn't it be a class class uh, I don't know so now we have sessions I'll scroll down here and here's the tracks right so we have tracks in a conference um, the live coders conf has only one track that's okay we only need one track we're just that good nah I don't know about that so there we go we've got a track now and we're gonna create some derived models so if we think back to the the database model there were different ways that things had to be connected right we had session speakers that referenced a session and the speaker who was delivering that session because we have this many-to-many -many relationship in relational data so we're going to go back over there and we're going to 
rename our models folder to data and start adding some of these other capabilities here. So I'm gonna F2 there and call this data. And if I open this up, did it rename? No, it didn't. I wanted it to rename that namespace everywhere. And it didn't. Um, can I F2 on that? Will it? I hope it worked. I hope it worked. Um, so let's create a session speaker. This is that intersection, like I was saying, that many-to-many -many relationship. And this is this is where I'm starting to pick up speed. We took some time really explaining what each of the fields and how a class worked. Well, we're, these are more of just the same types of classes here that we're just creating and interacting with. Um, so I'm not pulling that out of conference DTO. We actually want, <laughs> yeah, we're gonna create our own session objects over here. We need a session attendee object. I'm gonna, watch this, I'm gonna cheat a little bit here. Paste it into the same file, and I can control dot on this and say, move it to its own file. And it did, it's right there. So I'm gonna continue to go through here. We need an attendee object right, that has a collection of session attendees for the various sessions that they're attending. Let me paste in some of these other ones. Here's our session object. So there's our session object in the backend service. And it's got some other things here that you need to know when you're writing to the database, how it relates to other, right, a session, how it relates to its speakers and how it relates to its attendees and what track it's a part of. Right? Those are important things that you need to know when writing and interacting with the database. We need to know what a track is. So let's add a reference to the track and the track has a collection of sessions. Fantastic. We'll, uh, I think I already updated the speaker. Right, that was the first one. So now I'm gonna do that same control dot and see move type to attend CS. I'm just gonna go down the line here and move all of these files out. So we have one class in each file. That's a nice way to organize things. By having one class in each file, it means that you only change the file because the class changes, right? It helps to limit any, um, any friendly fire, any accidental breaking, where you may have accidentally changed something else that doesn't relate to this class. Thank you for the follows. Is that Christ of Pana and a uh, neat, neat pick? Thank you so much for the for the follows. Appreciate you joining us. Um, hey, Nikki. Yep, we've been going for more than three hours now. So now that we have all of those objects, we need to specify how do you save it? How do you get those into the database? And we do that by putting more entries into our database context. So we're going to define. I don't want to talk about model creating yet. I want to. We're going to define. We had. Uh, we had speakers in here as a DB set, right? A DB set says this thing's a table. Well, we're going to define these other three for sessions, tracks, and speakers, right? So let me take that and replace it. So sessions, tracks, speakers, and attendees. There we go. That's what it was. So we have those four tables defined, but there's also... A little bit of this many-to-many, -many, right? We define those many-to-many -many relationship objects, right? What a session attendee was and what a session speaker is. Well, how do we tell it that relationship between these objects? So in Entity Framework, we have this on-model creating method that you can override and specify how that relationship exists. So for an attendee, it has an index for a username and the usernames are unique. So we're specifying a little database information from here in .NET because we're going to right, we're going to generate a migration that updates the database appropriately. And a session attendee has a key that points to the session ID and the attendee ID. Cuz you can't right, you can't have the same attendee attend the same session twice. No. So an attendee can attend different sessions, but they can't. Uh, the same attendee can't attain, attend the same session more than once. 
Same thing with speakers. Speaker will give a session, but they can't give the same session more than once. Right? They might do a rerun of the session at a later time. So, um, you can work with a foreign key attribute. Yes, we're not going to be using that today. Um, oh, there's plenty of time here. Plenty, plenty of time. Um, and let's make sure that everything builds here. So I did it alt B U to build. There it goes. Build succeeded. It says over there. And at the package manager console, I can add migrations and update the database. So it right. So that it knows here's how the database needs to be updated. I'm going to do it here at the command line. I like the command line for this. So it's going to build and add that refactoring migration. So it knows where things reside, where that goes. So there we go. So now we have that refactor and I'm going to update my database with .NET EF database update. .NET entity framework tools work with the database. Here's the verb update. Apply all those updates that, that we just made to the database. And here it goes. Build started. So it's rebuilding because it just added the migrations for all those new objects we created. Done. Very descriptive. Done. Okay. You know, that's great. Um, if we look over here and we look back at that migrations folder, right? There was the initial one we created in the last module. Here's the refactor and you can see all the things in the up that it added, right? There's attendees, there's tracks, there's sessions, right? And the primary key for it. And it also created session attendee and it created session speaker, right? It created these other tables because we referenced and said that they exist as a connector between these other two objects. Really neat and it managed. And if we go back to our DB browser for this, and we reopen that database and it's sitting right there. There's all of our tables built for us. In fact, if I look at speakers, browse that table, it's still it left my entry right where it was. Great. Um, oh my gosh, Death Knight. I'm flattered. Um, really? I'm, I definitely want to do more of these workshops. Um, I, I think we have an update to the Blazor workshop we need to do. And I think we're almost, I'm almost done the Blazor for Web Forms developers uh, book. I think we want to do a Blazor for Web Forms developers workshop in, May's going to be an interesting month. Maybe in May. But I think we can do the Blazor workshop later this month. I think. We'll see. Um, but that that is very kind of you to say. Thank you so much. This is a one day, one video right through, and it, it'll be one really big video over on YouTube. I tried breaking it up into smaller videos before, and the smaller videos, eh, they don't get as many views. Where does one pre-order the book? Um, no pre-orders necessary. It's completely free. It's a PDF that's going to be available from docs.microsoft.com. Oh gosh, Dukasoft. Um, thank you so much. That's very kind. And Veronica Hex is already falling in love with Blazor. Cool. I'm glad you're enjoying it. You're not backing it up this... Thank you, Smap. The, the workshop that I gave with, um, with our friend James Montemagno. We lost it. <laughs> and when we, we lost it. And fortunately, Smab had a recording. <laughs> the Messy Coder is here. Happy Friday to you, my friend. Um, the Messy Coder is another member of the Live Coders team. Welcome in. So good to see you. We're working through this workshop here. So now our speakers controller, how we fetch and interact with um, how we interact with our speakers is a little bit different. There's a little bit more going on here that we need to get back because not only do we want to get speakers, we also want to get the sessions that they're including, that they're, that they're presenting. And we can do that, not just by saying, well, context speakers and to return those speakers, but we can say, include the sessions that those speakers are at and then include the actual session information. So you get back 
one block of information that you can present on screen. So let's let's update this in our speakers API controller. And and you can see, right, this is adding just a little bit more definition, right? Using a technology called Link, right? Link stands for Language Integrated Natural Query. It's a Q on the end there, L-I-N-Q. You can see the reference right there. But it lets us do this very fluent API here. Speakers, no tracking. I'm fetching data. You don't need to track what I'm doing here. And include the session speakers object. Then include the session. And now this is telling me it doesn't know what this is. Um, why doesn't it know what that is? Did we update the speaker to include session speakers? Did I forget to include that in the speaker object? I did. I forgot to include that. Oh no! Hold on, friends. Hold on. So there's that property of the session speakers. Everything worked there? Is it all good? Good. Everything lit up, highlighted that it found it. All right. Um. Oh, do, 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 do. I may have to build another migration. I'm, I may have to build another migration. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, build succeeded. Um, let's try adding another migration. Refactor, part two. You can it, the the name of your migration can be whatever. Let's if it finds that it needs to create a migration, it'll create it. Um, or I could down and create a new one. I could do that too. You're right. You're right, Johan. Um, there we go. <clears throat> and let's see what it created. Refactor part two. Nope, didn't create anything. So I could actually remove that. See? So, .NET EF migrations remove. And since it didn't actually do anything, we'll remove it. Right? There it goes. And it's gone, and everything still works. Oh, uh, mm -hmm. so oh, okay. Kamal asks a good question: What's the difference between an I collection and a list? It's a good question. Um, let me put that up there. There it goes. And there was Walter has now it. That rolled right over. That shouldn't have rolled right over. Um, you got a 24 cup of, of Madrinas. Fantastic. Um, but I wanted to focus on Kamal's question and come back to it here. There we go. What's the difference between an eye collection and a list? So I'm trying to think. Where was the eye collection? Wasn't it in... No. Uh, wasn't session speaker. Where did it, did I? There. So an I collection is an interface that defines that this is a collection of something. It's a generic co collection of speakers. A list is a concrete definition of a of a collection that allows you to add and remove items. An I collection lets you add and remove items. I believe it lets you add and remove items as well. Um, but it generically defines it because the implementation of this collection when it's sent over to the database, we don't know what it could be, but we do know that it implements an I collection. It could change at some point. So by staying with a very generic interface, a very simple interface that isn't a concrete implementation, we can have our session speaker objects sent back to us appropriately and it doesn't break our code each time. Digital Drummer J asks, will this session be available later on VOD and YouTube? Sure will. Yep. Yep, yep. Absolutely. It'll be available on the YouTube. Um, all right. So we updated the application context. We updated the refactor, the API controller. Um, so that's nice that we have a little bit of this searching put together here. 
inside the API controller. But that's database logic, and an API controller shouldn't have to do database logic, right? This is a little bit of application architecture discussion. Your API controller shouldn't know about the implementation of how it gets the data. It should know, reach into this object, get the data, get it from the repository, paint it on the screen, or, or send it out to whoever requested it. So what's suggested here is let's create a speaker response object that is a collection of sessions. So I'm going to, you know what, I'm just going to grab, oh, that didn't work. That didn't work. Where'd it go? I should have just done a control F to go find it, get back here. There we go. So let's create this in our conference DTO, a speaker response, because this contains a little bit of a payload that we're going to bring from one server to the next. And that payload is our collection of session objects. So, okay, we, and actually we're implementing, this is a speaker as well. So it's a speaker that has sessions, right? I don't care about the middle table. I just care about the speaker and the sessions. So that's what we've done here is we've, we've dropped out that middle information that we don't need. Thank you for the follow is that Zoner 001. Hey, Coding with Jerry is here. The YouTube channel, just like, just like the GitHub, the Twitter, C Sharp Friends. Real easy to find. Thank you, Veronica, for executing the YouTube command there. Um, Kamal asks a question here. Can we use a virtual list of session speakers, or is it okay to use that uh, so that the change tracker is able to track the records? Um, you don't know if the collection implementation is going to change. It might not be a list someday. It might be something else. Um, and so at, by using iCollection, it kind of gives you a little bit of, um, a little bit of, what's the word I'm looking for? Future proofing. That's a good way to describe it. A little bit of future proofing by taking that most generic of interfaces to reference it. it. You can do this. I think you can, I'm nearly positive you can do this, but just to future proof it, take it down just a notch to the less, to the more generic interface reference and you should do well. So, um, yeah, Death Knight, I, when, when you're referencing something that implements I collection or implements I enumerable in the same case, if you can reference that, then when the implementation changes, your code doesn't break. So, and particularly when you're crossing application boundaries, use interfaces as much as possible so that you don't run into any kind of binary incompatibility. And that'll help. So, yeah, there's a link in the chat. If you're, if you want to, if you want to check out and explore around the code, you want to navigate around, maybe have Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code open, you can do that. You can even browse through in your browser. Open another tab, throw it on another window. And as I'm talking through what's going on here, you can certainly browse through the rest of the solution right there in your own browser or in your own Visual Studio. Check it out. Click that link that's in chat from Stream Elements when that timer pops up. It's completely free for you to click through and use if you're here on Twitch. If you're watching on YouTube, click the link to the source code and you can navigate it there. Okay. So, uh, this is our speaker response object. And um, we're going to create an extension here, just a class that does this mapping. So that we can take a speaker and go get those sessions and turn it into the appropriate shape that I want to actually present, right? This is separating our database from our presentation layer. You might call this even a view model because it's it's the model of what we're presenting in the user interface for folks to be able to interact with. So in our backend data, when we fetch data there, we're gonna create entity extensions and we're gonna add this. There we go. And we're gonna add this method. I think we're missing, we're, we are, we're missing a curly brace there. Um, so that was in the data folder. We'll call this entity extensions just to do this mapping, right? I don't, there we go. Uh, no, maybe I was right. There we go. 
Um, and this is going to be a static class as well. There we go. Now why don't you... Look, there we go. So we're going to take in a speaker object and we're going to turn it into a speaker response that we're going to return, right? That's what this arrow, fat arrow is, is it says, when this method is called return a new speaker response, and here's how we map and turn it into that specialized thing that doesn't include those session speakers. That We don't need that information. Um, so now we turn our get speakers method in our API to map, right? We're gonna map that out so that we get our speakers formatted very nicely here. So let me save that. I'm gonna go back over to speakers controller and here, right? Paste that in. There it's doing select map speaker response, right? Just like you would do in, in a relational database or whatever database, right? You're gonna select out something and you might choose specific fields you want returned from your table, something like that. Well, that's how we change this. And our return type is now not a I enumerable of speakers. It's not a collection of speakers. It's a collection of speaker responses. And we're going to get our using statement in there as well. Cool. Right? We're going to do the same thing with the get speaker method here. Right? Um, so, come here, you. Right? So, when it gets just one speaker at our conference, we'll paste them in. And this is returning a speaker response. There we go. Everything should update here in just a second. There it goes. So, looks good all right um this is saying remove put post and delete speaker on the speaker's controller that's fine we don't need those um i don't think we need speaker exists either cool all right let me take a look. Let me. I think this is a good point to pause and take a look over here at the chat room. See if we have any comments, any questions we need to follow up on. <laughs> Death Knight. <laughs> Every time he does that, I wait for the call-in number and the call letters. Reminds you of a radio pitch for a commercial break. Thanks so much for tuning in. You're talking to, you're listening to C Sharp Fritz right here on www.twitch.tv. We're going to go to the phone over in the Discord channel a little bit later today. We'll open it up for Phone In Friday. If you want to call in, call 1-800-DIAL-FRITZ. No, I don't know. Go to the Discord server. We'll open it up and you can call in. I don't know. Maybe we will do that. Maybe that'll be fun. So, um, I, I need a good radio DJ shtick, right? Something that sounds radio DJ-ish that we can respond to. I don't know. So... We'll figure it out. We'll do something there. <laughs> All right. Good. Good, good, good. Um, I have the cadence info. Well, thank you. Um, so here, let me... Uh, Confuse Lele has a, has a good question here. And, and this is another application architecture thing. Why not have the logic for map speaker response in the constructor in speaker response? That's another great idea. Sure. You could do that. Actually, no, you can't. I'll tell you why you can't. Um, so the constructor for speaker response, you can't put map speaker response in here because map speaker response knows what session speakers are. The speaker object here, right? This is in the backend service, knows what knows that relationship. The DTO object doesn't know that relationship. This, that session speaker relationship table, is a database concern. We as, as web browser consumers, web users of this application, we don't care what session speaker tables are. We care about the sessions the speaker belongs to. So we can, we can make this go away with a little bit of magic, right? With a little bit of... Uh, magic. We can make it go. <laughs> there we go. 
Um, phone in Fritz Day. That's that's not a bad idea. We could, we might be able to do something with that. Um, is that abstract has a question for us here? What's the difference between putting static extension methods in the static class versus in a non-static class? Good question. Um, very. Let, let's talk about that. So by putting this a static class like this, these are called extension methods. I didn't. I didn't explain this too well when I created this. Um, a static class only holds static methods, static methods and static entities. There's only one of these in the entire application. So this method, map speaker response, hangs off of the entity extensions, the one entity extensions class, but it's an extension method because the object that we pass in, the parameter here, starts with the keyword this. And that's a trigger that tells the compiler, oh, we'll go find this type. And this type speaker is the backend data speaker. And, and extend it, add a feature, spot weld onto this, this method, map speaker response, and, and skip this. There is no other parameter to pass in here. Let me pause for a second because we've got 100% sentiment in the chat room. Everybody's happy, having a good time here, and I hope you out there watching the recording are having a good time as well, and you're learning a lot. Let me know. Drop me a line on Twitter, on the YouTube channel, or even over here on Twitch. We're always happy to hear from folks that are watching the video. So, this is added as an extension instead of on the session, uh, the, where to go, the speaker object over here, because, right, by, by putting it over there, it keeps this class, since we're using this, to persist, to write back to the database. It keeps it clean of those methods. So it's just the properties that we're saving and reading back and forth from the database. And we're extending, we're adding these features to it that aren't exactly methods for each instance, right? Or uh, it is for each instance. There aren't exactly methods we want to pollute the logic for persisting and working with the database. Um, and and um, Brave Cobra does make a very good follow-up point there. Let me make sure I share this. Um, classes that use extension methods are harder to test and you cannot mock them out. It is. So, right, you cannot test this very easily using one of those unit test frameworks we talked about earlier. Very good point. Um, uh, Johan, what will make me sad? Um, oh no, .NET Kyle. If you say boo, does that bring, the, well, we're at 100%. Everything brings the sentiment down at that point. So, yeah, don't make me sad. Um, is this Kai Devrim asks, can you make desktop apps using ASP.NET? The answer would have been no. But what you're seeing folks do is ASP.NET Core is hosted inside of a console application. So what folks are doing is they'll write ASP.NET Core applications and host it inside of an Electron application. An Electron application is, right, it's a, it's a window frame. It's an application frame that hosts the Chromium web browser. So it's just serving from a web server. And folks who use Chromium based, uh, Electron based applications like Visual Studio Code, uh, Teams, Discord, Slack. It's just an, it's, it's a Chromium browser hosting a node application and serving web pages that you're interacting with and trafficking data back to the web server where it makes a decision maybe. So folks are doing this with ASP.NET Core more and yep there we go there's a link to electron.net is one way that folks are doing this there's an interesting way folks are doing it with blazer the blazer framework and we'll look a little bit at blazer later where they're using blazer with an application frame that's cross-platform compatible that uses even less memory than the chromium browser so you serve blazer components and it hosts inside of it and you get a lower frame, lower processor and memory usage. So folks are trying that out as well. So the answer I would say is 
Yes, but it's not a recommended thing that the ASP.NET team says go out and do. There are open source projects that go out and do that, and there are some tremendous experiments to support that. Thank you so much for the feedback. I really like that discussion. Really, thank you so much, Kai, for for asking the question. Really happy to, to talk about that. The bot is fritzing out. What did the bot do? Can't stop the bot. Can't stop. No, we're okay. You run a Blazor application using Kestrel locally on their machine, says Marcus, voice programmer. Cool. Why are we using virtual? What if we have lazy loading, enabled context? Eh, you could do that. You could certainly do that. We, we're passing across the boundary here, across application boundaries. You don't want to lazy load this. You want to eagerly load this and pass it out. You don't need... Um, lazy loading for this. We're passing an API. You're not going to go back and reload data. R right, we've crossed an, crossed an application boundary. So you, you can't really do lazy loading at that point. Right, load it all at once and, and output it. And it's a simple database format. So doing the aggressive loading and bringing back the entire data set isn't too hard. Jean Valjean uh, comments that Entity Framework works pretty good with MySQL and uses it for a few projects. Yeah, the, the point of Entity Framework is to abstract away the database implementation. Whether it's MySQL, like we're doing here with SQLite or SQL Server or Postgres or Oracle, it all works with the same language here in my c -sharp code. And you have a translation layer that turns it appropriately into the SQL to interact with the database. Yes, it, a link does trigger the bot. Well, foo.bar isn't isn't a link. Right, I can write something like, what's cool at bing.com, and it answers. See? The Fritz bot is eager for social interaction at these, these trying times. .NET Kyle, thanks for the resub. Thank you so much. I'm not sure how far back did that happen. Did I... I missed that some time ago. Seven minutes ago. My goodness, I'm sorry. Appreciate it. And with every sub, every cheer here on the channel, we're going to make a donation to the World Health Organization to support them um, as, as they fight the good fight against COVID-19 and get us past a uh, little bit of the problems that we're having here. Get us out of quarantine. So thank you, Kai. I appreciate the kind words. Um, Nikki asked a question. I'm, I want to get back into the code here, but I want to make sure we touch this question for Nikki. Um, do you need a data access layer? DAL is a you know, three-letter abbreviation, three-letter acronym for data access layer. Something like a repository pattern if you use Entity Framework. No, you don't. Um, we are using a little bit of... Th this is a little data access pattern-ish because we are putting... Um, all of our data access in our backend microservice. So all of our entity framework, all of our database interaction is in that application. So effectively, the entire backend service is becoming a repository. So it's not bad. You can do that. You don't have to. Um, and it's a question of how far do you want your data concerns to pollute your, the rest of your application, right? This is a little bit neat and tidy, putting all the data concerns in one place, which then feels more like a repository pattern. If I had my, my choice, I would encourage more of a repository pattern so you can hide those database concerns and switch out your provider at some point in the future. So, thank you so much. Johan, with the 500 bits, cheer, fight the fight, so that we don't have to say, fight the fight, stay home, absolutely. Stay home. Enjoy tuning in, have some fun with us, asking questions and having a good time here. Um, and and the you've seen the link for the live share if you want to join in. And uh, those 500 bits, we'll make another donation to the World Health Organization. Get them some support in fighting the fight against COVID-19. All right. So we've got our map speaker response here. So we've got things formatted appropriately. And there are other classes that are available out here in the save point folder. You can click through and see exactly what these look like. We're going to do the exact same thing with all of these other objects. 
you're you're welcome to download the source code and look at it it's very repetitive i don't want to repeat the same thing again and again and again so i'm going to go into the save point folder that i have here on disk and just copy in those features um right we don't we don't need to see how all of those are structured like i said they're pretty well the same so this is the folder two backend completed and we're going to grab each of those response objects in the conference DTO project here. And I'm going to go to that same folder in another. And uh, I'm here in Twitch Workshop, Conference Planner, Conference DTO. And we're going to copy in attendee response, session re response, conference, res I don't see conference response, track response, and tech. I don't see those other ones. Hopefully there's somewhere out here. Paste those in, sure. And they should appear down here. There's session response, speaker response. Where'd the rest of these go? Let me go up and see, are they in, are they over here? Nope, don't see them over there either. Where'd they go? Um, do, 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 do. They're not over here either. Where'd they go? Hmm. That feels weird. They should have been there. And the other update is the entity extensions class with these other new methods here. So that was in backend data. Mm-hmm. There it is. Um, open. Thank you. Uh, entity ex... Uh, where'd my entity extensions class go? Where'd they go? Did I put it in the wrong place? Entity extensions. Oh, create an infrastructure folder. Put it, I did. I put it in the wrong folder. Nuts! All right. Let's move it. Add new folder. Infrastructure. And I'm going to move here to there. Yep. Go ahead and move it. Right. And yeah. Good. So we're going to update that with the one that's completed that has these other mapping files, the other mapping methods. So I'm going up one, infrastructure, copy that in. Yep, replace it. So map session response. So if we have a session, go get the session speakers and bring back the speaker information and bring back the track information. Map a speaker response, there are those. Map attendee response. See, I don't have an attendee response class. Did I? It's got to be around here somewhere. Where'd I put it? Right? Is it out here? Do we have it way late in the day here? In the back end service. Uh, data? Nope, don't have those other responses. Where'd they go? Oh, because they're in the DTO project. There's a 10D response. I'll copy that one in. There we go. So, there we go. That updated. Good. All right. Whew. Hey, Terry Andrew Davis. This is the ASP.NET Core workshop. You can see, get a link to the source code there and follow along if you'd like. There's also a link floating in chat. You'll see it pop up every now and again to get into the Visual Studio Live Share if you'd like to participate that way as well. So I copied in a lot of these, right? These are a lot of the same types of things. And there's the ability to upload data into this. We added the ability to upload because there's there's a bunch of file, a bunch of data that it makes sense to have loaded so you actually see some, some data that kind of looks familiar here. Um, there is a sessionize loader 
There's also a dev intersection loader here for the dev intersection. Um, for the dev intersection, the format that that conference uses for their um, their their sessions. So I th think, did I put it, where is it? I've seen it here, there we go. Copy these two, and I'll copy session eyes also. And I'm gonna go update. You don't need to worry about what these things do, just that they load data and save it to the database. Okay. So it's it's a data loader here that loads data asynchronously from some file. For the dev intersection one, it takes in a file and here's how it iterates over the, the JSON in that file and writes it to the database. This isn't what we're trying to teach here today, how we load data into a database, but it, it's stuff that we're gonna use just so that we can load data in there. Um, and what this is suggesting, turn on the option to display enums as strings. Um, sure. Start up. Uh, yeah, go ahead, say. Uh, do, 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 do. Right, it was under options swagger doc. Here. So you'll see what this does for us in a minute. And there is a file here for NDC Sydney 2019. There's a couple other files in here as well. Um, there we go. For other conferences that we've presented this at in the past. Um, tell you what, let's grab, yeah, let's grab NDC Sydney 2019. Um, and open that. And I'm going to, I want to view the raw version of this. No. Yeah, raw. There it is. All right. I'll save this file to disk. Just so I can upload it, right? Um, ASP. There we go. Um, actually, I should have this on disk, shouldn't I? It's probably out here somewhere, right? Right, because I've cloned this. Come on, Jeff, think this through. You know what you're doing. Maybe I don't. Um, backend data import. All right. So maybe I already have it on disk. Uh, backend. Uh, well, that's my version that I'm working through. Do, 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 do. Uh, source. Backend data import a hey, there they are we'll load one of those files so we get some sessions here that we can look at it's a session from another conference would have been nice if i had one for the live coders conf but i don't and i don't want to spend time building it i want to get through and build the next thing um so doo -doo -doo, run the application to see the updated data via swagger ui use the swagger ui to upload with the api sessions upload api so let's do that so i'm going to start and we'll have updated user interface here with all these new features that we have to interact with the data for all those different data types of our conference sessions and tracks and attendees and all these different things and we'll be able to get in here and take a look um coding with jerry asks where did i get the hat uh this is a custom hat that i made i had made at my local embroidery shop and it w I had it made for the Visual Studio 20 2019 launch coincidentally was a year ago this weekend and uh, I was the MC for part of that and uh, I had two of these hats made one for myself and one for uh, Scott Hunter has the other hat so look here I can get speakers and here's information about the various schemas um, those other controllers didn't appear. Didn't we, didn't we load controller? We didn't load controllers in here. I forgot to copy those over, didn't I? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I need the sessions controller and the attendees controller. So let's go back over here, controllers. Um, 
So I want the sessions and attendees. Yeah. All right. Copy those into my version because these are these really do all of the same thing that we have been doing, right? So, um, try this one more time. Um, Terry Andrew Davis has a question. Let me come to your question here in just a second, Terry. I want to get the data loaded up here. And, uh, and we'll come to your question. It should be loaded any second now. Ta-da! Here we go, and interface! Just like I planned it. Um, so we're going to upload sessions. There we go. Post into API sessions upload. So I'm going to post there. Try it out. Format is... That's kind of crummy. Um, which one is zero and which one's one? Um, do, 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 do. This is... It was sessions, right? Wasn't that it? Uh, where's the upload? There we go. Conference format. And it was zero and one, so zero is sessionized. That's what um, NDC uses. And we'll browse. Let me go get the file. C dev ASP app workshop. And I'm going to drop down into the source because it's here under, right? It was data import. And let's grab NDC Sydney 2019 and load that data going to go through and uh, did it work I got a 200 okay so that's good so uh, give me all the sessions let's see what all the sessions look like that we're gonna load now and here's my response body there's there's a session from our friend Heather Downing if Heather's out there watching look at that uh, the care and feeding of software uh, the care and feeding of software developers there we go so all kinds of stuff all loaded up from that JSON source file. And now it's in our database that we can work with as we continue through. Um, so Terry had a question here. Let me make sure I put this up. What are my thoughts on using AutoMapper to create mapping profiles for mapping the DTOs instead of the manual mappings? AutoMapper is great for exactly this. Terry makes a very good point here. Um, absolutely great way to do this if you want to use auto mapper um, we don't have that many objects here so not that big a deal to do it by hand but auto mapper uh, from our friend Jimmy Bogart and his open source community is really great for that and I can tell you really like it because 100% sentiment in the chat room are you kidding people know me you must and you love the 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 workshop thank you so much for the 100% sentiment that is tremendous so it I agree with Terry. Check out and use AutoMapper to help map your DTOs. That's a really great idea. Uh, let me take a look here. Let's keep a look at what else is happening here in chat. Do, 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 do. Okay, there was Terry. Shane Boyer is here. He helped write a little bit of this workshop. Shane? Shane? You over there, Shane? There he is. Jeff S. Swagger. While showing swagger. That's right. This is my fight, so take back my life. Bring it. All right. Um, let's see what else is going on here in the chat room. Let's make sure we capture everybody. Um, Wanna Paradise. I, I didn't turn the thing back on. Let's turn that back on. Is this ASP.NET Learning? You bet it is. All day long for beginners. We're going through this. Um, do, 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 do. Vertical slice, okay. Um, Johan with a comment about Heather Downing. She's an amazing speaker. Heather's a great speaker, and and if things work out, I'm gonna I'm gonna try and invite invite Heather. We she's very interested in joining us for our 12 hour session that we're gonna do in two weeks. Two weeks from today, 12 hours on stream. Next week we've got 14 hours with the live coders. Two weeks out, the week after that, 12 hours here live on stream as a reward for hitting 10,000 followers on stream. Thank you, Terry, for the follow. All right. How are we doing? Dude, dude there's a link to Auto Mapper. Fantastic. I think we're good. All right. Let's move on. That's the end of the second module. And that only took us an hour and a half. 
we got to pick up speed here, friends. We're never going to get this thing done. So now we've got now we've got sessions that are available in our backend data service. They're being saved to disk inside of a SQLite database. In SQLite database, that's pretty flexible, easy to use. It works on every platform, including uh, Windows, Mac, Linux, iOS, and Android. So let's start building a front end, a website that can actually start reading from this API. And we're not pushing folks through this Swagger API, this open API user interface. So they have to interact with it. Um, we're getting there, Nafe. We're getting there. Coming. That's that's coming up. I think it's another module or two down. We're going to get to security. And and at that point, the 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 uh, police lights. I, I need to have police lights come down. A visual effect to have police lights come down from the top of the video, and 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 klaxons go off um, to summon our our friend on the security team, Barry Dorns. <laughs> Barry is the chief security officer for uh, for the .NET frame the frameworks and tools, making sure that that things aren't published that uh, that are insecure so um, we're gonna add now a front-end project that's gonna consume this is going to be our web front end that's gonna let folks interact here with uh, with this back-end service that we created so let's add another project um, you know what this time let's do it on the command line I showed you how to add a project here in Visual Studio let's do it this time on the command line real easy to do so I'm going to clear up. Let's shrink the font size there a little bit because you can see the font over here, what I'm doing. I'm going to add a front end project. Let's go up. There we go. And .NET new web app dash O front end. And it's going to create a new project in a folder called front end. And that's what dash O is. It says output in this folder. Now we're going to add a reference to the conference DTO project, right? That's that shared library of things, right? The the various data objects. Let's add a reference. Um, I'm in, I'm not in the right folder. Do uh, no. There we go. Add that reference right here. Come on. Oh, it did it. All right. And um, it didn't add it to the solution file. We need to add, add it to the solution file as well. So uh, .NET SLN add front end. That should work, right? Yeah. There we go. So now it's in the solution file. So before I delete any unwanted content, check this out. Visual Studio says, oh, the solution was changed. Let's reload it. And three of three projects. There's my back end project. Close up. You, close up. And now I've got these circle of patience. Uh, I'm still trying to ask you to close up. Thank you. And here's my front end project right here. So, um, next, we're going to get rid of index. Uh, we're going to get rid of the HTML content on the default page here. And we're going to start. We're going to start making this do some more than just display some static content. This is a front-end web project. It's a web project. It references our conference DTOs, and it's a .NET Core 3.1 project. I like to have the framework as the top item in the project file. That's just me. It feels right to have it at the top. Inside of our project, we have several different folders here. Um, properties is just a collection of properties that says, here's how you launch the application. We've got our dubdub root folder here. This is a, a folder that contains all of the static content that we don't want .NET to interpret. Everything that you're just going to serve directly to folks browsing the website goes in the dubdubdub root folder here. CSS, JavaScript, any libraries that we might be referencing like jQuery? Sure. Um, your fav icon and right we have our classes and things hanging out here but here's the razor pages these are the page first page centric models that we can use 
to build our application. And they're right here. And we're going to start inside that index file. These are Razor files. That they're a mashup of uh, C Sharp and HTML. So you have some HTML down here. And you have a little C Sharp at the top. And every C Sharp statement starts with the at sign. So we have these directives, these single line items up here, at page. This is a page. This is intended to be served as a page from this location inside the application. So because I'm inside the pages folder, index is actually a default page name. So when you browse to the root of the application, you're gonna get this. Conversely, well, similarly, if I go to the privacy page here, this is at page here. It's going to answer on the name of this file, so privacy. But I can change it. I can have it listen on a different name. Maybe I don't want to have it listen on privacy. Maybe I want to have it listen on um, um, Brexit for the win, and I want it to listen on that location. You can do that, and that's where it will listen, and that's where it will respond. But typically, you want it to listen on the same name as the file name. It helps with discoverability for your developers that need to navigate through this. Okay, something happened and sentiment is two. Two? What's going on there in the chat room? Um, scrolling up here. Do, 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 do. Let's see. Lemons galore. Um, how does the speaker response object handle errors? What if there's an error when posting a speaker to the database? That's different. You'll see that in a little bit here. Um, we're, we're, we're getting there. It's coming. Um, all right. Do, 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 do. There we go. Yep. Stream started at 10 a.m. Eastern. Um, let's see. Uh, what's this from Ulix? I've, I've lost the thread of what you're talking about there. Live share? Did live share go? Oh, because it restarted. Oh, rats. Because it reloaded. All right. Let's kick live share here. Uh, make it read only. And I'm going to update the live share. There we go. And here's the live share link. Sorry about that, friends. Uh, must be halfway. No, we're not. Nope. So, all right, so this is the content here that it displays on the home page. Welcome to building web apps with ASP.NET Core. Meh, that's lame. Let's get rid of that. And we're gonna start wiring up a client, an, an HTTP client, to go fetch data from that other service so that it always gets our content. This API client is what's going to handle the errors. It's going to behave appropriately for us. So we're going to create a services folder here that's going to contain information about how we interact with other services. So I'll create that folder. And I'm going to create I API client. And it's not a class. This is an interface that we're implementing, right? Just like we were talking about I collection earlier. This is a generic interface that defines how we interact with our other services. So I'll copy in. These are the methods that we want our website to be able to interact with from the back end service. Get sessions, get speakers, get sessions for a speaker right? Get a specific session, maybe. Get a single speaker, put a session, upload a session, add an attendee to, just create an attendee, right? Get an attendee based on their name and delete a session. So these are what we're creating in our default API. So now we're going to set up the API client, the HTTP client, so that it knows how to make requests to web servers. Hey, Dr. Frax, good to see you. So let's add this package. I'll do this at the command line because why not? That's where we are. There it is on the command line. Add the package. Good. All done. So we have that reference. Now let's create an API client that's actually going to use that HTTP client, right? 
the, the to be able to make requests to other servers. So I'll add a class API client. There it is. Let me copy in the source code and let's talk about what this is doing because this implements all of those features that we just described in the interface. And I'll scroll up here. We'll fix some of these red underlines. Yep, get our using statement in there. We'll get another using statement over here. One more down here. Here a using statement, there a using statement, everywhere a using statement. Old McDonald had a using statement, E-I-E-I-O. Okay, got them all. So, let's talk about this. Um, control M, Control O collapses up everything so you can see very clearly. These are just the methods that we declared in our interface and we're going to implement that interface, okay? So we've got our generic definition of what a client, an API client is, and here it is. And when we want to get, let's get a session, right? When we want to get a session, we know, because we when we built the backend, the backend services, right? We have our sessions controller, and it has a method here to get a session. Well, it's listening to retrieve this session on API slash member controller with square brackets is the name of the controller before the word controller. So API slash sessions. And if we pass in on the, the ID, it'll retrieve a session. So that's what's going on here. Go to slash API slash sessions, whatever the ID is we've requested. Now this dollar quote turns on a feature in C Sharp 7 called string interpolation. So you can change your your string to start interpolating it by putting um, curly braces there. So this is all text. Curly brace, whatever's inside here now is C Sharp and curly brace. So by just putting ID there, it says, we'll drop the ID right here in the string. Cool. So this is going to take the HTTP client and go get API sessions ID, triggering this method and returning sessions. Now there was a question about what happens if there's an error interacting with the database? If there's an error interacting with the database, because this is marked as an API controller, it will turn it appropriately into an error response object and return that to our calling method. Brilliant, right? If it doesn't find the session that you requested, it'll return a 404 not found because it's not in the database, eh, not found. So it knows how to do this. Brave Cobra, we're gonna do that in hour seven. We'll talk about gRPC. So really great stuff that's built in here to be able to handle this appropriately. So, got that all set up so now it knows how to go through and do these and if you look at the rest of these methods they're doing very similar things oh get sessions we'll go to api sessions and return and this is the interesting part here right not just ensure success status code right this says well if you return to file not found or something right file not found will return null here well if you return any kind of an error code throw an error is what this method does right there's look Throws an exception if there's a problem there. So it'll, the API controller will appropriately format as an error. This will raise that up and you can handle it appropriately on your page. So different things you can do there. If it did succeed, it'll proceed into here and will return as a list of sessions the JSON that was returned to us. Really great stuff. Um, and I hope easy to follow along and see. But now we need to give it the location. We need to tell it, well, where's that web server running so you know where to go and find it? Is it running on Bing? Is it running locally? Is it running on, the, on this cloud, that cloud, the other cloud? I don't know. So we need to tell it where it is. Well, inside ASP.NET, there's a way to configure... Just like we had services on the back end, we have services in startup over here that we can configure. And we're going to configure our HTTP client 
so that it knows how to create an API client and pass into it a configuration that says, well, out in our configuration somewhere is the location of those services, those backend, ser backend services. And we're gonna write that out and tell it, well, here's where you can go find it. This HTTP client that we're injecting and manage and into our service locator will be managed and passed around just like our database, uh, our database application context was in the backend service. It's gonna manage how many instances of this, the lifetime of it, and pass it around appropriately. But we need to tell it where that service exists. Well, this configuration object is saying, well, go get the service URL. Where does it get that from? In ASP.NET Core, you can store configuration on disk in this app settings JSON file. And it'll, it's, it's JSON. You could put whatever content in here hierarchically, hier, hierarchic, hierarchically, in whatever format you'd like, and you can traverse it from your configuration object um, with exclamation points, I believe it is, between the various things that you want it to navigate down. Exclamation point might be colons. So, can we transcript these streams and turn it into a book? Sure, go ahead. Um, so, we need to give it a service URL, and this is saying to make it localhost uh, HTTPS localhost 56.009, um, but we're going to need to make that wherever it is that this is being served up here. So what I'm going to do is go up here and do a properties, and it's actually localhost 5001 is where this one is being served. Yours might be somewhere else. There it is. So now it knows how to find it, how to connect to that service. And it's going to reuse my HTTP client right there. So how do I get data and start listing sessions on that homepage? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to create an index model, right? This is some C-sharp that sits next to that, that Razor template, that CSHTML file that knows how to go and get that data. So let's do that right here, not shared, here it is. So this is our page model. This defines how the, the code that interacts with and executes behind that Razor template. You don't have to use a page model. It's nice to have it available to you so that you can test and execute this thing directly if you'd like. Um, and we're, yeah, we're automatically going to reference these things. It is colons to separate those. Thank you. To navigate the hierarchy of configuration, it's colons. I get it confused between colons and exclamation points and underscores. It's double underscores if you create the environment variable. You can store these in environment variables and load configuration from there too. But I, it was exclamation point at one point for something. So, and I, I get, yeah, I get confused about that. So we need to receive, just like we did with the database object, we need to receive our um, our input of the API client. I want to keep that logger around too. Yeah, I want to keep the logger, but I want to add that API client into the mix. So let's kind of smush these together. Um, smush is a technical term for merging source code. It's a technical term. I've got red underlines. We fix red underlines with control dot. There we go. Give me those using statements so that it adds, a, adds the front end services reference. There we go. So now I can add some properties to store some of the data that we're going to fetch. Sure, let's do that. Right, we know what properties are. We're gonna lay this out with some information about the different data that we're gonna end up presenting on screen. Um, I controlled spaced. Thank you. All right. So we're going to we're gonna go get sessions and put it into a property so we can paint that on the screen. Some day offsets, right? What are the, the various days of our conference so that we can display those? And the current day. What's the current day that we're looking at? So we're going to get those properties. And we're going to do it when we navigate using an HTTP get to this page, right? 
That's just like when you browse somewhere on GitHub, you browse to the Google, you go to the Bing, you go to the DuckDuckGo, you put the in front of the names of all the search engines that you're referencing. And, right, you do that HTTP get. You just browse, you typed in the address and said, go to this location. You went to the twitch.tv. You went to the, the YouTube.com. Uh, and you're going to get, because you typed that into your browser, or you clicked the link and it went somewhere, you're going to get that data. So on get, when we do an, a get of this page, execute this code. Now, I got a red squiggle here. I need to change this into an asynchronous method. And this is a thing with, with, with C Sharp. You have asynchronous methods and you have synchronous methods. Asynchronous methods are decorated with a keyword async at the beginning. And you can release the thread that you're working on, right? Let it go do some other work and come back when it's done processing. So asynchronously, go get data from that other web server and we're gonna wait for it, right? Await, wait, don't do anything else here. Go let the other threads do their th things. It, when it's done processing, resume right here and put the results into the sessions object. So that's what async and await does here for us. So um, we're gonna get the sessions, we're gonna figure out well, what's the start time, what's the minimum start time here. We're going to determine what are the days of the event. So we're gonna get the distinct dates of the event. So select out the individual dates of each session start, um, order by those days, and we're gonna select out the different offsets for them. We'll set up a little bit of a filter if there's a day selected that was passed in here. And we're only going to select out, look, sessions where, this is doing a filter, where the session start time date, right? So this is saying for each session, take a look at the start time, grab the date, and where that date is the date that we're filtering by that was defined here. Order by the track, group by the start and order by the start time that key is a start time all right now we can put some html on the page i went through a lot there let me go back over to the chat and see if there's any questions um can, uh, do, 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 do. can we automatically reference the service url for the project settings no you can't going across to the other url you can only reference the URL for your current project. Um, so, yeah, Link is very, Daryl, Daryl code stuff is here. Yeah, Link is very flexible. It feels, as somebody who's a database, uh, very familiar with database, I wouldn't say I'm a database person. This feels like a nice database query here on lines 48 through 51. This feels like something that I can wrap my head around that I understand what this means. I just need to know what the S's and the G's are that it's filtering, grouping, and ordering by. But that makes sense to me, right? Um, so let's go over to that index razor page and let's add some markup to output information about these. And I'll just post it right there. So we'll have an agenda and I'll say my conference and the year of my conference for each time slot in our sessions collection. So model is the page, right? Model is a reference to this class, right? It's gonna give me the instance of this index model. Um, and the dot sessions. So that's the sessions property here that we set at the end of the on get, all right? So for each one of those, um, let's write out the time slot in hours and minutes, right? So we take the time slot, the date of it, and write it out in 24 hours and minutes, 24 hour, uh, hour syntax. And for each session in that time slot, right, output the title. Kind of makes sense. And the, the HTML around this is pretty straightforward. Um, and we need to set up both projects to start at the same time. I see a question there in the chat room. I'm gonna come to you in just a second. I want to make sure I get to your question here before I go too far, but I'm going to set this up to start both the back end project and the front end project so I can run both at the same time because I 
I need to have the back end web service running when I run the front end so I can have it connect to the two. Let me come over here to chat. I saw a question over here. Um, Hypnotoad asks, how do you get those nice arrows in your link instead of the equals greater than? He's talking about these right here is what Hypnotoad, I'm sorry. I, Hypnotoad, I, I assumed a gender there. My apologies. And there's also um, the double equals and the double plus. Um, these are called ligatures, font ligatures. And the font that I'm using here called Cascadia Code, you can execute the font command. There it is, Smab executed it for you. Has these types of characters in it. And Visual Studio is aware of how to handle those. Um, if I do a control Q and I type font, and we take a look at the fonts that are configured here. Um, there's a way that you can configure the font to do font ligatures. I don't see it here. I thought there was a font ligatures. I thought there was a ligatures feature. No. I guess if it knows, if it sees that it's a font that has ligatures, it'll use them. And it and it looks really nice. It, it's certainly a little bit more readable, the intent of having those two characters next to each other. Um, there's also, you can do less than equal, you can do greater than equal. Oops, I put, <laughs> if you do, Right, that was, um, if you put the does not equal uh, less than and greater than next to each other, right, it'll put them together like that. I can do like this. Um, and you can do, right, exclamation point equals, right? And when you get rid of the space between those, it turns it into an appropriate does not equal. So it just looks more like the actual characters we'd like it to be. VS Code is the one with the ligature option. That's it. Thank you, Smab. Um, Angry Little Hamster asks, What happens if you have a select as.starttime question mark dot date here if the start time is null? Um, it'll just make it null. It'll just select null into the collection. So... But all of them do, so it's good. Um, Wanadza, very good comment here. I like I like seeing this. Sometime, uh, somehow I felt like C-sharp is feeling like TypeScript and JavaScript. Funny thing, the same folks that make TypeScript also make C-sharp. So, right, that TypeScript is very much a, a, a way to bring strong typing into JavaScript. And they're both object-oriented, so... To, to bring those features into JavaScript is tremendous. And things, features that are proposed from TypeScript are being slowly added to JavaScript. It's terrific. That's great. Everybody, if you want this type of strong typing, if you want some of these features in your programming language for the web, if you're targeting JavaScript, TypeScript is a great way to use that. Very good point, Winatza. You missed the Java horse, JavaScript horses. Yep, I have them turned off today. Sorry about that. So, and there's all kinds of hijinks that we have during the week, during normal, normal um, sessions together here on stream, including the JavaScript horses that go running by. We could use some buttons to allow set navigating to those different sessions on different days. So let's add an unordered list to the page just below that h1 so an unordered list will create some navigation pills and for each day in the day offsets the collection of days of our event we'll create a list item that is a nav item and it'll be appropriately decorated as a navigation link that's active or inactive and check this out over here will route it will generate a route and we learned about routes way early in the day here about for our backend service we're going to generate a route parameter for a day and we know what a day is for this because it's right there so we'll pass in the day as a route parameter based on the day offset and we'll just do a day of the week to string as the text to appear inside this navigation pill We'll see how that looks when we start this. 
right now. So it's starting, it's compiling the entire solution and it's going to start both the back end service and the front end service at the same time and load things up. Hypnotoad, thank you so much for the follow. I appreciate you joining us and I look forward to seeing you in the channel. I mean, we've already had a couple nice questions there and I'm happy to answer any questions. No question is too simple today. This is really targeted for beginners and to get folks comfortable with .NET Core, with ASP.NET Core. So here we go, loading up. You're gonna see actually two browsers open here, if I did this correctly. So this is opening on, there we go. So there it is, localhost 5001, that's where we saw it working earlier. And here it is up here, there's the front end to my application, okay? So we wrote a little bit of HTML, it connects using that API client and copies and and right does a query. It doesn't know that API client is is going across HTTP, but there's nothing keeping us from having that access the database directly, right? I can use that same interface that I API client in in a Blazor application and and go across the HTTP boundary there as well, but it, it queries and returns my data and it places appropriately here just outputting for this on screen and these are hyperlinks to look at the other days so i can see that data and and notice when i click back and forth the url here puts a day equals up here and that day equals that you see is being passed into that on get method that was written in our index right it's passed in here for us by ASP.NET and it's using that as the parameter to do the query and bring back the appropriate data that's over here. That's right, Daryl. So now, those of you that are on live share, it opened a browser for you too. And you can navigate around the application if you're on the live share and right on cue, Daryl, well done. Points to you. See that? Daryl got some coins. Um, the the bot just dropped the live stream link right as it went live. <laughs> um, Hypnotoad. No, no. Um, the font ligatures are a relatively new thing that uh, that are being used in the text editors. So check out that link if you want to be able to navigate around. I'll restart the app. And, and it should join you into the application running here on stream. I'll start and I'll stop and restart this one more time so that you can see it running in your browser, um, literally on your browser, on your machine. So check this out. Um, coding with Jerry, um, asking about different libraries other folks use for different database providers. Okay, that's a discussion for those folks. So now if you're connected on LiveShare, you should get both of these browsers opening and you should be able to navigate around them. And even more so, I should be able to see your requests coming through both in the debugger over here and maybe in the info panel here. So, um, Really, really great stuff to be able to share and allow other folks to navigate around the application. Live share really is changing the way that folks collaborate so that you can get the most out of working together with your teammates. While, and I'll let some folks take some time doing this. Um, Barney on, uh, hang on, Barney of the Rubble says, I bet it won't let you work on Safari. Um, give it a try. Click through. Click that link there in the chat and uh, see if you can get connected. Um, it should work even on even on an iPhone. Um, Dr. Frax asks a, asks a question. Let me bring that up. Hey, there it is. What's the idea behind Blazor Web Components? Is it aimed at developers who are comfortable with C-sharp and don't want to dive into JavaScript or Angular Web Components? Or is it intended to compete directly with the aforementioned? My concern is that it's another silver light in the making. Okay, so let's break this down. There's three or four questions there. 
that I want to make sure we we land on. Um, Blazor is intended to be a component-based user interface framework. That way, you can build and, and reuse sections of, uh, of components um, using C Sharp and, and HTML, CSS, JavaScript, wherever you're building an ASP.NET application, whether it's going to run in WebAssembly on the browser or it's going to run on the server side. Your choice of where you want your Blazor application to run. Concern that it's a Silverlight in the making is completely unfounded, and I'll tell you why. Blazor, since it'll run on the server, means even if for some reason uh, WebAssembly gets turned off, gets blocked in the browser, um, you still can run it on the server. However, it won't get turned off. Blazor, uh, I'm sorry, WebAssembly is an HTML5 feature that every browser supports. And thanks to our friends Spectre and Meltdown, when we had that issue two years ago, everybody had to upgrade their browsers. Even Grandma at home on her web TV. So when they upgrade their browsers, they got all the latest features of HTML5. It even works on your mobile phones, on iPhone, Android, and the like that support HTML5. So it's not Silverlight in the making. Is it intended for developers who are comfortable with C-sharp and don't want to use JavaScript, Angular, and those things? Sure, absolutely it is. It's not intended to take over the world, but there's a lot of folks that are comfortable with, with C-sharp and .NET, have a lot of business logic built that they want to be able to reuse, so use it. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> um, Wanadza asks a question here about LiveShare. Um, LiveShare is breaking some company policies. Is there a chance you can host the LiveShare server for internal purpose? So here's a really neat feature about LiveShare. You don't have to host a server. It'll actually do peer-to-peer -peer connections. Um, and it only goes to the LiveShare server if there is... Um, if there is a, a, a slow connection between two endpoints. So if there's folks in Australia and Asia that are trying to connect to me here in North America, it's not correct connecting directly to my machine. Instead, it's connecting to a server in the cloud and relaying through there. But you can turn this on to... Um, not shared. I've turned on shared servers. But you can set this... Here we go, connection mode. You can set this so it's only direct connections or it's only relay connections. I have it set to auto so it'll decide appropriately how to serve and connect with those. So if I set that to direct, it'll turn into a different formatted URL that you can share with your colleagues and they can connect directly to your machine. No, no middle connection required. So thank you for the question, Wanadza. You're welcome, Dr. Frax. Um, that's that's kind of the goal with today is trying to be clear and concise here and get folks in and and productive here quickly. I'm going to stop the application here. It's our friends that were on live share interacting with it. I'm going to take that away from you here, and let's let's clean up that user interface a little bit more. We can make sessions look better by <coughs> by using Bootstrap cards. So check this out. Let's replace that list of sessions. With some with some cards, right? Uh, go over here and um, do, 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 for each one of these, I think this is where we're replacing them for each one of the sessions. So time slot, we'll create a row, and for each session in the time slot, we're going to generate some bootstrap cards. Right, it's a terrible Russian um, Russian accent that I'm imitating from. Uh, rounders and uh, uh, John Malkovich, Malkovich, Malkovich. All right. Um, so I can save that and I should be able to really quickly restart this because the razor doesn't get recompiled. And everybody that's out there on the live share should get a new copy of the application starting right now. Um, yes, Evan. Absolutely. 
be really useful working remote with your group. A lot of folks are using LiveShare while we're in quarantine, while we need to work remotely, to be able to collaborate and navigate around code together in in full read-write mode is very handy. That uh, And a lot of folks right now, especially, are seeing good success with that. So now I get cards being output here for this. And now I can see nice looking set of cards here for each one of the sessions in the event. And it wraps nicely because it's bootstrap. Very cool. Um, Hypnotoad, this is a common question I get. Would I use Blazor over Angular in Vue? Yes. Yes. Blazor is going to give you it with the same support as um, as what you get from .NET. You're going to get three three years of uh, free support. You're going to get a fourth year of upgrade support, so you can upgrade to the next version. Blazor is included. Blazor server side is included with ASP.NET Core three one. So you're going to have great support for Blazor for the next four years. You can't say that about Angular and Vue. They're open source. The support you have is go read the source code. When we get out and Angular 12 is released, you're not going to get support for Angular 8. You're not. Um, but you will have support, and you can pay for additional support if you'd like for Blazor. So strictly from an enterprise application development point of view, I'm going to pick Blazor over one of the JavaScript fr frameworks every day of the weekend, twice on Sunday. Especially if my team is familiar with .NET. Support is a big, big thing here when you talk about enterprise applications. If you're a startup and your folks are more familiar with JavaScript, absolutely go with the JavaScript. I'm not going to debate you on that at all. But you need to consider long term when you're building applications because you don't want to be maintaining the same application and the same features every day for years and years and years. Trust me, you're going to get bored and you're going to find another job. And then your employer is going to have a real hard time finding somebody to support and, and knows the ins and outs of Angular 4 because that's the version that you developed with way back in 2018. So... It's, it's a thing that you're going to want to consider. So. Debating with an architect with an enterprise feature about a enterprise feature is really hard. It is. You're right. Um, Hypnotoad has a follow-up, and this is a good follow-up question. Thinking of private personal use. Still Blazor coming from .NET and C Sharp. I hate, I hate that you have to work with Angular. So if you're... I use for personal use, use what makes you happy. You're familiar with .NET and C Sharp? Use Blazor. You're familiar with Angular? You're familiar with JavaScript? Use Angular and JavaScript. Nothing wrong with it. Nothing wrong with it at all. But it's a question of how happy are you going to be to maintain these applications? Not just you, but your enterprise, your employer, the company. The investment for support, when we talk about something that's going to be supported in the year 2030, is Angular still going to be around? Don't know. Blazor will be. ASP.NET Web Forms has been around for 20 years, and they've committed to at least 10 more. And there's people asking for 10 more after that. So when you think about long-term applications that you're building, you're going to want to go with something that you can support over that time. And you have all the source code for Blazor as well. So. Um, Coded Beard has a follow-up comment there. Writing home automation system with Blazor running on Raspberry Pis. Okay. Home automation system running on Raspberry Pis. You don't even have to drop Blazor in there for me. Home automating system running on Blazor, running on Raspberry Pis. That's pretty cool. That's neat. Blazor with that, generally awesome. I'm very happy to hear that. Um, um, I've never heard this term. The Lindy effect means that something widely used will remain supported because of inertia. By who? By who? 
Who can I go to and pay for that support? It's not Google. Angular's not bad. No complaints about it. And, and, and nothing against any of these frameworks. But if you're looking for long-term support, if you've already got great familiarity with .NET, use .NET. Uh, Barney thinks that Blazor will be another VB script instance. I patently disagree. You're welcome to that. Let's see where we are in a year. Currently working on a voice assistant that works from a progressive web app on the Raspberry Pi, turning out to be difficult without using cloud. Well, yeah, right? There's things that you're going to want to bounce off of other services to get assistance with. Um, deep, is that, is that Draffle? How do you pronounce that? Thank you for the follow. Um, good luck finding somebody at Google. Just finding people at Google. Just finding a contact on the Google thing. You can patent that, sure. How is page model going to behave when one page has many different get methods? That's a great question there, abstract. So... If you have different ways to come in and filter and, and do this, you can add different parameters to it so that it will filter and behave appropriately. You can change the way that get method is prioritized. Um, and there's even ways that you can set up different handlers, different handler names for that so that it will behave appropriately and answer differently. So you can have different on get methods with different input parameters. So different there's ways to do that i'm not going to dig into it here but you can I, I i'm not sure if that additional filter is here but there there's there are ways to add additional uh, add additional get methods to handle those additional parameters um so you overload is what it calls it having multiple get methods we need a session details page for this so let's add a session H CSHTML page. I'm going to stop. So all our all of our friends that were navigating around there, we just broke them. And we are going to add a razor page. We'll call this session. Okay. Um, come on, finish loading. Let's go. Hey, that noob. Welcome. Um, no, I can't continue working. You didn't paint the screen. Thank you. Um, and we're going to put in the page model for this. Uh -huh. There we go. Mm. So we need an API client. We've got some red underlines here. Get those in. And we need a session response object. Down here. There we go. Add that. There we go. So now it's going to receive an API client. We have a session object that we're going to load up the day that it's on. We're going to have that information. And we need to add a page handler method. This is that right, a page handler that on get. We're going to output this so that it knows how to go and get that data. There we go. So on get, we're going to return an action result, right? We're going to return that page. We're going to get the session for the ID that was passed in. If we can't find a session with that, here's, here's the error handling, right? We can't find it, right? We got a 404 that bubbled up to us. We're going to redirect back to the home page. Um, go get all of the sessions and find the start date. That look, feels weird, but okay, we're going to go get the start date for this and grab the day offset for that. It, well, we'll have all of the day offsets, right? No. Why is it getting this? Hmm, that's the number of days. That's the start date. Okay, so I guess it's just going to count up when we build the user interface. Let's take a look at that. So here's the user interface. 
Um, let me, I'm, I'm going to copy this in so we understand what's going on with this. So session just had page, model, and then some content. But now, remember I mentioned we have, you can change up how the page is handled, where it's located on the page directive here. So we have the this ID in curly braces. It says, this is a route parameter. This is a parameter that's going to be passed on on the URL that you need to capture, and we're going to do something with it. And that's what's being passed in right there. So we're going to receive that, and our model is that session model class, this, which is another page model. And here's some HTML. We're going to output the breadcrumbs for the agenda with the various, with the which day it is and the session title. And we'll output, here's the details about the speakers, about the abstract, if there's an abstract, and the name of the session. So, kind of makes sense when you think about what that's going to look like. And if I, I start this, I'm going to start this without debugging, so it starts a little bit quicker. We'll see what this looks like. Doo, 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 doo. Yes, identity server you can use with Blazor. And Blazor is not something we're, we're focused on today. That's another topic really for another day and another workshop. Um, so here, this is loading. I've got, I've got two tabs in the same browser now, which feels a little bit better. So now if I click through into here's Heather's session, so it opens up, I'm in session page, and see it put the URL on the end, the, the session ID on the end there, one, right? A nicely formatted top there using agenda slash day and right the number day it is the title there's the title and there's information about our speaker but we need to have this route and, and go over and tell us something about Heather right we'd like to learn a little bit more about other sessions that Heather is presenting some other information about you know maybe there's right we had bio and hyperlink there in our speaker details so right maybe there's some data we want to load up for that as well so we'll create a page for our speaker details. So I'm going to add another page. And it, this feels natural that I'm adding Razor pages that are specific to um, that. I didn't spell that right. That's not spelled right. Rats, 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 rats. But I'm, I'm generating pages that answer for what are very page specific content. So, right, it, the, the concepts that we're working through here match nicely. So, yeah, see, I, I spelled this wrong. I'd, I'd like my cursor back, please. Thank you. Um, there we go. Rename that. And it's, it's not going to rename these things. I'm going to have to do this by hand. And I'll rename that file. Fix that. All right, so that works. There we go. Yes. I got that wrong. And actually, um, so let's update our page model for the speaker. We're gonna teach it how to go and fetch information about the speaker, which is over here. Uh, nope, nope. Wasn't what I was looking for. Uh, hang on. That, paste it in. There we go. Format it a little bit, fix some of our red underlines. There we go. And get that speaker response object populated. Come on. Everything's starting to grind to a halt. It's gonna be time to restart Visual Studio soon. Nope. There we go. All right. 
but we need a page handler so it knows how to go and get the speaker. That's easy. That's easy. All right, come on. Put that put that using statement in there. Ah, there we go. So on get, we're going to pass in an ID. We're going to get speaker async. Get that speaker information from our API. Um, if you don't find it, return not found. Otherwise, return the page and we'll populate that page. So let's load this up. Look at this. It almost looks the same as what we had before. We're going to receive an ID on the URL. Use that same speaker model object. Have some breadcrumbs at the top that say speakers and then our speaker name, Heather in our case, it, she was our keynote speaker. The speaker name goes in, in an H2, right? And these at signs are saying output this information from, from the model, right? From the model, go, go grab the speaker object and output their bio here, and then list out the sessions that they're presenting. Easy. We can add some objects so you can do a search if you'd like. Let me run this so you see what the speaker page looks like. So yeah, it's the live share instance. Yeah, it's it's transmitting so much data that it's having a little bit of a, a problem navigating around. So when I click in here, now I can click onto Heather. And you see, if you can see way small down there in the corner, it's going to speaker slash 72. So there's Heather and here's her one session that she has as the keynote speaker. And I can scroll down here and let's see, let's, let's find, here's Ryan Nowak. Right, and Ryan doesn't have a bio listed, but he has two sessions here and I can click into those and you can see who the speakers are and where and when they're presenting. So I've got, that's nice. I've got a little bit of back and forth there that I can do between those various instances. And let's add some searching, right? We're gonna add a search controller all the way down the stack controller all the way down the stack oh my goodness so that we can do searching right this is right now we've got this vertical slice and a little bit of what uh jimmy bogart does right we've got a vertical slice now if we want to add a whole new piece of functionality searching i need to add a dto something that's going to traverse across the application boundary I need a DTO search result that contains, well, here's the information I'm returning. I need to have a backend API controller that knows how to search the database. I need to update my API client so it knows how to search and interact with that search. And then I need a front page that knows how to actually serve the search. Now, I think I've walked through a bit of this so you know how to do this. So you can see a little bit of how, you've seen a bit of how this works. And I'm, I'm gonna leave it to you to be able to navigate through and look at all the different things there. Um, interesting. So, um, sorry about that. So this is all, it's, we're going to take the exact same thing that we did before and we're just going to build it again, except searching across the database, searching through sessions for a search term, searching through speakers for a specific search term and outputting that information. So there's a lot of time, there's a lot that can be done here to to update and bring out this data appropriately. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to cheat. This is already built, it's already available for you out there. I'm actually going to go back and grab the source code for this because you don't want to see me type all this in. That's boring. Um, right, do I have? Nope, I've only got the one open. So let me open Twitch Workshop. And let me open the source over here. This is the finished code. So I'm going to go into the back end service here and I'm going to go into controllers and grab the search controller. 
bring that into my backend service. Here, it does the exact, it, it's the exact same source code, that's just the finished code over there. Um, there is no search over here, that's the only place that it's updated. I'll go into conference DTO and grab search result and search term. Bring those forward to here. So now we can search. We have a, we have a way to trans to transport our search query term and the results of that search back. Okay. And finally, I'm going to go to the front end and go into pages here. And I'm going to grab the search, bring that in, okay? And I'm going to back up just, um, oh, I need to update the, I think I already have it in the API client, don't I? Because I brought it in there when I built that, right? It's under services. Um, no, it's not here. Uh, let's see, go under services. And I'll bring these two in. This is, like I said, the completed version. So everything that we're going to get to is in here as well. Yep, replace those two files. So now... I can add search, uh, the search page is on the front end, which just outputs the results of your search. You can take a look at that, but we need a navigation item. So I'm gonna go into the layout. So here's how Razor does layout. And this is kind of interesting. We've looked, we've kind of passed over the shared page, shared folder. This is where the shared assets that Razor uses and com combines are located. So, it has this underscore layout by default. This is the layout that's applied to all of our razor templates. And you see down here a render body method. That's where all of our content is going to be placed inside of our application. So it wants me to add this to the navigation pane. So where those nav items are. So we have home, we have privacy. I'll, I'm going to put it right in between the home and the privacy links. Um, and you're not going to format for me, are you there? Visual Studio. Fine. Just for that, I'm going to put a Q tag in there. Save that. So now I have a search link. Yeah, right. So let's give it a shot. Yep, Plural Site is free this month. But there are no there are no authors out there listening and answering to your questions. Thank you for the follow, that noob. Appreciate it. All right, so there's the Swagger UI. Here's my front end. I can click search, and now I can search. So let's search for people named Scott. And nothing comes back. Why does nothing come back? Maybe we search for, uh, well, we know Heather is somebody and we're not getting Heather. So what's happening? Let's, uh, let's do a little debugging here and see what's going on. So our search page is over here. When I click that link, it should be doing an on get async and going and getting the data. If I go over to the UI over here, we try and do a post on search, try it out. And we're gonna pass in Scott. Do that. And it doesn't return anything. Hmm. Change that to Heather and nothing so something's happening in our back-end service that it's it's not finding anything why is that there's my search controller so it should be hitting here the search finding the session results finding the speaker results and gluing those together so let's put a breakpoint right here and restart this and see what's going on 
Am I searching case insensitively? Oh, I bet you that's it. In fact, I know that's it. I know that's it. Yeah. Include track where title contains that. Right? So not only do I want to do it contains, I want to say my string comparison is invariant culture ignore case. Right? So that it's case insensitive. And I'm going to copy that down into each one of these. I've made this mistake before. Let's rerun that. And we should start getting some search results. Yep. Those bite you every time. Thank you for the follow. The shoes. Welcome in. Is that the shoes or the shows? I'm not sure. There we go. All right. So now I should be able to do a search. Right. Oh, look at this. We broke it. What do we do? Oh my goodness. Um, it shouldn't have searched for anything yet. Hmm. So we got a little bit of a problem there. Let's see if we can go fix that. Um, so let's do this. Let's, let's put a catch in here. Right? And let's say, um, if string is null or empty, uh, the term, um, return. Don't do anything. Let's see how that works. I have to go in a few. That's uh, Thanks so much for sticking around all day, Evan. Really appreciate you tuning in. And let's get this restarted here. So let's try search again. Nope. Why is it searching? I told it not to search. Search line 29. How to get there? If string is null or empty. Right? Why does it think it's doing that? Shouldn't get there. Uh, let's see here. All right, try search. We hit my breakpoint. There it is. Term is null, so it should return. Good. And now we're hitting this again. Term is still null. Um, okay, so... We need a, um, all right, let's do, um, model is a thing and I only want to go through this if search results is not null, is, I can kind of force that, can't I? Um, yeah, let's do this. say search results equals new list search result. Wow. I think I'm typing too fast for live share. 
Can we add Elvis there? No, you can't. Because model is always a thing. And need to fix that E. That should work. Yeah, good. Now, mo so when you use question mark dot, like model question mark dot search results. No, no, it, 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 confused Lele, that's a very good question. Can you do model question mark dot search results? So when you do that syntax, it only evaluates search results if model is not null. So in this case, model is always something. We want it to behave differently if search results is null. So slightly different, but I can, I absolutely understand the confusion and I actually had that confusion just a second ago. So. Yeah, you can't do a for each on null. You could do a for each on an empty list and that's what we just provided there so that that handles appropriately. There we go. So now if we search for Heather, still we get an error. Look at this. Woo. All right, let's see if we can fix this one. Where do, where do we break this? So something broke back here. Look at this. Right? Uh, comparison type invariant culture ignore case could not be translated. All right. So this is this is because of how I tried to wire up the um, the case insensitive search, right? These. So if we change this slightly right and if we say query is that to lower invariant then we can say title to lower in variant right and do the same thing with the name there and we'll do the exact same things down here and it's only on this where clause right excuse me there we go one more time let's see if we get this Yeah, the queries are going to run client side now. They're going to run. Um, the collation sequence on the database. I don't want to. I don't want to have to do that. The database is a separate concern. Um, I just want to get a match. I want to do a search. Do I prefer method or query syntax? I prefer the methods. So now try this search again. Oh, look at all them errors. Oh, look at all them errors. No, 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 no. So we're really running into an issue here with the We're really running into an issue with the um, with the search here. Um, and by doing trying to do the search here, it's pushing the, the yeah, it can't turn these into SQLs. What's running into here is it, it doesn't know how to. Where there is a to lower command in SQL Server, there isn't in SQL Lite is what I'm running into here. So another way to do this would be to force the to list in here so that it actually filters inside this method. 
All right, so this is a client side filter it's going to do. To list, so it this returns a, and I need to put some parentheses now around this. And man, this feels kludge. Right, so that await, right? I should be able to, yeah, I can dot where on that. And uh, I don't need to list async on this. I can just do to list. And that's okay. That should work. That should build. Um, change the first character of the search term to capital. Well, you don't know. It, it might not work that way further down. Hypnotoad, thank you for the sub. Um, and we're going to make a donation to the World Health Organization. Oh, uh, Evan Weeks gifting a, a sub to Hypnotoad. Thank you so much. And we'll make a don donation to the World Health Organization so they can fight the good fight here with COVID-19. Let's restart and see what we get. Come on. Um, I did a control F5. Ah, oh, there it goes. Thank you for the following. Commander Q. Welcome in. Yep, I know to list is not async. But the to list async is async. We need to wait for that to finish before we do a where clause on it. And the to list. Uh, you're right, uh, Matt. Extracting some variables would be good for readability. You're right. Um, I, I know build succeeded. Run already! Here we go. We want to find... Wow! Object reference not set to an instance of an object. Look at this, search controller line 40. Here, there's no bio. That's what that is, there's no bio. Oh, it's getting messier. But we're putting all of our database search logic, the messy code, in one place so we can reference it and we don't have to worry about it. Right? Let it let it live over there. And we'll keep this running cleaner outside of here. Come on. And I think I think Visual Studio Live Share is taking a powder here on us. Because it's flat not responding. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. Are we coming back? There we go. Okay. Yeah, where's the Jeopardy music when you need it? <laughs> uh, yeah, now that I have this in here. Right. because this will return null. There we go. That's what we want. 
So adding the double question mark here says, if this is null, default it to false. If it doesn't have a bio, it doesn't match. Now you're gonna, yeah, I'm gonna get this now. I knew I put the value in the wrong place. I knew it. Yes, yes. Now, wait a sec. Hang on. Let's take a look at this. Oh, come on, man. Right, and the contains. Yeah, I'm um, in IntelliSense stopped responding here locally. Um, I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna stop live share. String doesn't have a value property, but a nullable string value does. Yep. Right, string dot um, right, speaker dot bio, and I'm I've lost IntelliSense. I can't even save. I look tired. Oh, we're we're not done yet. I'm this. Yeah. Yeah. No. Where are you going, Windows? Yeah, Visual Studio has 28 processes running. Mm. Let's reopen that. More coffee required. Absolutely. We're going to finish this search and then we're going to we'll take a little break. Absolutely. Right, so I should be able to say dot bio here, and no, you're not gonna you're not gonna give me this, are you? There we go. Speaker dot bio to lower invariant contains, and that should return that should return right. And if that, if that's null, we'll get a false out of it. One more time. Are we back on AI April on Sunday? You bet. Yep. Thank you for the follow, Shannon Tierney. Welcome in, Shannon. Tinwi, welcome. Let's see if we can get this search working. This... Right, I want to be able to search for our keynote speaker, Heather. Bang! Look at that. Object reference not set on line 40, which is, now it's name? There, there's folks that don't have a name? I mean, I... Right, I guess we're gonna have to do the same thing here as well. I mean, it feels weird to do, but. Um, where to start with C sharp? Um, about six hours ago. Take a look at the video, rewind about six hours. 
Now what? Try that again. Yep, LearnMicrosoft.com is a good source for everything Azure. They're slowly getting C-sharp features up there. There we go. Oh, my on. All right. So now we can do a search, right? So if we want to search for Blazor, so here's a session, there's a session, right? Um, if we want to search for just .NET as a keyword. Right now we've got, here's all these sessions, right? Really great stuff. So now it works. Ugh. All right, fantastic. So now I've got search working and I'm gonna commit that source control so that I don't screw this up in the future. And we haven't even made it into section four yet. And now we're gonna let you log in in the next section of this. <laughs>